Hello, before this video starts, I wanna thank you for helping me hit 50 subscribers on this channel. This is a pretty big milestone for me in this channel, and I wanna thank you again for subscribing. Also, in my previous video, I did say I was going to do a giveaway, and I do plan on doing one still. So, in order to enter, please leave a comment below on this video. Thank you very much. And now, without further ado, here's the video. In the spirit of the month of October, I want to talk about two anime that I feel they deserve to be looked at again. No, they aren't spooky or gory by any means, but they do have a goth girl as a lead character, and both have amazing soundtracks. The two anime I want to talk about are Witch Hunter Robin and Irigo Proxy. Both these anime were aimed towards an older teenage audience, or towards the goth subculture that was fairly prominent at the time. They both weren't mainstream, and it seems fitting since goths generally take pride in being away from the mainstream. And ironically, that is a shame, because both these anime are pretty good and deserves more attention and eyes on them. And this is what I want to do, starting with Witch Hunter Robin. There'll be very light spoilers ahead for both series. Witch Hunter Robin is produced by Studio Sunrise, now renamed as Bandai Namco Filmworks. First aired in Japan in 2002. A year later, it was licensed to North America by Bandai Entertainment, and was screened alongside Cowboy Bebop the movie and S. Cryed during the third annual Metreon Festival of Anime, which was a very early 2000s way of saying anime convention. In 2004, it was aired on Cartoon Network's Adult Swim Lock. After Bandai Entertainment closed down in 2012, it was rescued by Funimation alongside other Bandai titles. The story of Witch and Robin is, well, it's kind of its name actually. Robin Senna, an 15-year-old Italian-Japanese girl who is a craft user, someone who can do supernatural things, in her case, she's a pyrokinetic, able to light things on fire, and use fire as a protective shield. She uses her abilities alongside other hunters to hunt witches. Not the kind you're thinking of, but there are other craft users whose abilities have reached full maturity, and they usually become homicidal or sociopathic. In the world of Witch Hunter Robin, witchcraft is a genetic trait, not something magical. Those that have the witch gene, but their powers haven't manifested, are called seeds. They are watched over by other hunters, who are often other seeds. It is the duty of Solomon, a secret organization dedicated to keeping the existence of witches a secret from the general public. They try to capture them alive, if possible, and are detained in an undisclosed location. Robin is assigned to the Japan branch of the organization, where the series takes place. I think it's an interesting take on witchcraft, and Witch Hunter Robin makes a lot of references to Judeo-Christian lore and witchcraft. In the DVD, they even have a witchcraft compendium, giving you information on the references they make in the anime. Robin is an interesting lead character. She's quiet, soft-spoken, and introvert for the most part. But you can't help but follow her journey throughout the story as she matures and learns about the truth of her origins and the world around her. You're learning about the world through her, and she knows enough about the world to get by, but isn't aware of how deep the world is, kind of like how you were as a teenager thinking you already know everything, but not as much as you think. She acts like a teenager still, pouting when she's teased by her older peers and refusing advice from them from time to time. It's pretty cute when she pouts, and it helps that she's generally a pretty cute looking character, but she's a kind person, always caring about the well-beings of the people around her. Robin's pyrokinetic powers isn't an instant win button for her, and it isn't utilized how fire is used in Fire Force, for example. Robin uses her power as a last resort or if the witch being hunted is incredibly powerful. She uses it to try and quickly prevent more harm being done. The only thing I don't like about Robin is how she turns into a, well, a lovesick teenager when she sees Amon, a tall, handsome, brooding man voiced by Crispin Freeman, the voice of many iconic characters, which, to be fair, yeah, I kind of can understand why, but the issue is she's 15 and he's 25. And, uh, well, it's implied that Amon might be uh, romantically interested in her. It isn't outright said, but the implications are kind of there, but it's really up to your uh, interpretation. Witch Hunter Robin has a Monster of the Week format for the first half of the series, getting you to understand how the world works and what kind of witches can exist in this world, ranging from super destructive to morally questionable witches. You see how the STNJ, the Japanese Solomon branch, operates and get to know the other hunters Robin works with. In the second half of the series, it becomes a Jason Bourne movie for the most part. Robin and the other hunters are trying to uncover the mystery and conspiracy behind Solomon, 
and what happens to the witches they capture and the ultimate goal of the organization. The pacing of Witch Hunter Robin is pretty good, given they have 26 episodes to tell their story. The world feels familiar, but different, and the technology they use is kind of wild seeing it 20 years later. But the art style is unique and stands out in my opinion. It has a mix of anime and realism in it. You can see these characters walking around our world, and after re-watching it for this video, I think the animation holds up pretty well. Although there isn't an HD upscale of the series, I think you should watch it in its original resolution, for that retro feel. It also has an all-star English voiceover cast. All of them went on to voice a lot of iconic characters in great animes later in their careers. The soundtrack is a banger. The opening theme, Shell, has the most early 2000s rock vibes. You can't help but vibe out to it when you hear the opening guitar riffs. I wonder how much of that sound was inspired by Evanescence, who started taking off in popularity around the same time. Speaking of Evanescence, the main character for Ergo Proxy sure does look a lot like this lead singer for the band. Let's switch gears to Ergo Proxy. Ergo Proxy first aired in Japan in 2006 and was produced by Manglobe, the studio that produced Samurai Champloo, Michiko and Hachin, and The World Only God Knows, and other great titles. It sadly closed down in 2015 for bankruptcy. The series came to be after Manglo approached animation director Shuko Murase, who was also the director for Western Robin. With just the title of the anime, a general concept of a futuristic detective thriller, and the plot outlined for the first few episodes, they pretty much gave him free reign on how to proceed from there. Murase moved the anime in a philosophical direction, with the central theme of the anime being what is existence, or for the philosophy majors out there, Kogito Irgo Sum, I think. Therefore, I am. It came to the West in mid-2006, with Genion Entertainment publishing its DVD releases, and was aired on Fuse TV in 2007. Box sets were released over the years in the early 2010s, and Funimation currently holds the licensing after Genion sold many of its titles to them in sometime in 2008. It's difficult to discuss the story of Ergo Proxy without turning this into his philosophy class, so I will do my best to try to explain everything the best I can. Eagle Proxy takes place in a future where humans and machines called Auto Raves live together in a dome city after an ecological disaster left the world in ruins. The purpose of the dome cities was to keep humans alive while the outside world was being cleaned up. So they engineered proxies, a race of engineered superhumans that oversees the dome cities and can help with the cleaning of the earth. And life in the dome city of Romdo, it's boring. It's too perfect and the citizens are fairly obedient to the people running the place. There's no culture, it's too sterile. It's possible that the citizens are so obedient because the majority of the people that are born there are born artificially, where parents can get a custom-made baby to their like, ranging from being born to do a specific job or be the perfect child. It's very orderly, but this is where Real Mayor comes in. Rial is seen as a bit of a weirdo in Romdo. She doesn't exactly conform to the social norms there. She finds life there dull and boring, even with her life essentially being a detective. She is with the Romdo Citizens Intelligence Bureau, where she is investigating a string of incidents by auto raves. These auto raves are infected with the Cogito virus, a computer virus that makes auto raves self-aware. And this is one of the core themes of Eagle Proxy, but I'll get to that later. In the first episode, Rial is investigating an incident involving auto rave selling attacking humans. She meets Vincent Law, our second protagonist, who is an auto rave disposal technician. We learn that the auto rave started to attack the humans, and Vincent and his co-workers had to put it down. It was confirmed in an autopsy that it was infected by the Cogito virus. This is where we see a dynamics between Vincent and Rial. Rial is a citizen of Romdo, and Vincent is an immigrant from a different dome city. When Vincent comments that the weapons they had to use weren't super effective in destroying the auto rave, Ria responds with, are you complaining? Vincent quickly says no. There's a massive power dynamic between a citizen and an immigrant. Vincent is in the process of applying to be a citizen and he doesn't want anything to affect that process. While I don't think Ria's comments are from a dislike of immigrants, I think it's from a position of being in the upper class. She is directly related to the regent, the person in charge of Romdo. But the point is, immigrants are treated like second class citizens in comparison to actual citizens. When she's investigating an abandoned building inhabited by illegal immigrants, Rial is attacked by a creature, which we later learn is a proxy, and is shaken by this encounter. 
She knows that thing isn't an auto rave and is definitely not human. She wants to know what it is and examining the crime scene to gather clues. However, her auto rave companion Iggy is warned that she isn't allowed to do that. This warning was from the security bureau. Iggy is connected to their systems. Later that night, when Rial is about to take a shower, the creature she encountered earlier busts through her ceiling and looks down at her. Another creature jumps down and attacks the one looking at Rial, busting out her windows as they disappeared into the night, presumably continuing their game of hide and seek. The first episode does a great job of making you interested in the world they live in and wanting to learn more about what's going on. Rial being an investigator is a perfect vehicle for the audience to learn about the world through her. Vincent is also another good vehicle for the audience to learn about the world, and is very relatable. Vincent is an average guy, working a 9-to-5 job trying to move up in the world, and is caught in Rial's investigation after he's falsely accused of being Rial's attacker. While I haven't talked much about him, it's difficult to without going to spoilers, but I will say he has an excellent voice actor and his character development is worth the journey. I am barely touching the surface level with themes, ideas, and social commentary with Ergo Proxy. Themes like what is existence? What makes a citizen a citizen? And the treatment of the auto raves. After doing some research for this video, I never made the connection that auto raves could possibly mean automatic slaves. When you say out loud a few times, it's hard not to unhear it. It's absolutely worth watching, and for the big brain philosophy majors out there, I think this is something you'll enjoy. The visuals for Ergo Proxy are still amazing after all these years, and it upscales very well for HD quality. Each episode feels like a mini movie. There's a lot of production value put in each episode. Even if the majority of the color palette is dark, it does a good job of using those colors to tell its story. And I guess it helps that Rial is so pale and Vincent is wearing a red jumpsuit to make them stand out in their world. I hope I was able to convince you in giving these anime a watch and find enjoyment in them like I did. I genuinely believe these two anime should have gotten a lot more attention than they did when they first came out a decade ago. After you give them a watch, let me know what you think. I genuinely want to know. A very special thank you to the artist of this video's thumbnail, Frain Doe. They have a very unique style that I thought would fit the theme of this video. Please check out their Instagram page to view more of their incredible artwork. Once again, Thank you, Frain Doe. Also, there won't be a video next month, maybe one in December. I don't know yet. It's the holiday season now, and you all, you know how it is. Also, please check out some of my older videos. I think they could use some more views and more likes. But please follow me on Twitter. And again, thank you very much for your support.